Well, first I want to thank Professor Hill for asking me to talk on breast reconstruction. And I also want to thank all of you for turning up here tonight. It's really important to support things like this and getting awareness about their both of breast cancer and successes and also to talk about the reconstructive options so people realise. So I basically put this talk together to talk about general things that I get asked in outpatients in moment all the time. Who is a candidate for breast reconstruction? When should a patient have a breast reconstruction? And what type of reconstruction should they have? So, to, just to address the first point, the reality is, in the start of the 21st century, that there is no real major contraindication to someone having a breast reconstruction. So all patients are for a breast reconstruction. And really, the earlier, the better. So if we have it at the time of surgery, they get a better result. However, you have to be cautious in certain patients, and this is where smoking does come in, because it does slow down your healing. Obesity or previous radiation, or if radiation is going to be a part of your treatment, you have to be slightly more cautious and tailor your approach to that patient. Breast reconstruction, really the levels worldwide, are not good. The best place we have for data is in America, and really only about 25% of ladies go ahead with breast reconstruction. Of this group, they're divided into immediate, at the time of the resective surgery, or they have an interval between the resection and have a delayed reconstruction. Now there's various reasons why this is, and it's basically divided into the patient. When it comes to reconstruction, the pa there's an opportunity for patient empowerment. So it is, does come down to the patients. There's not a definitive protocol for a patient that says you must have this reconstruction. There's a great element of choice, and that can be useful for someone who's gone through the traumatic experience psychologically of, of have, having a mastectomy. So it's quite useful if you can say to the patient, well, you get to choose what you want to get. But it's not just them. You also have to take it in, into balance what the breast surgeon, the planned treatment. He knows what the tumour biology is or what the plan, if there's going to be adjuvant treatment, because that might change your reconstruction. And also from the reconstructive surgeon's point of view, he has to assess what's the state of the opposite breast, what's the size of, of the lady's breast, do they want to stay that size, um, and basically the ptosis of the breast or, or the droop of the breast and how we are going to successfully match that with the reconstruction. So it's really a, a real joint decision between the patient, the breast surgeon and the reconstructive surgeon. But in essence, if someone is having an immediate reconstruction, you're really only trying, talking about replacing volume. Because the skin envelope can usually be kept. But if you're having a delayed reconstruction, you need to replace skin and volume. So it's a little bit more challenging. So there's a wide variety of reconstructive options, and it is, can be quite confusing for the, for the patients when, you, when they come into the clinic first and you're trying to divide it in. Now, the easiest way I find for talking about it is to talk about implants or prosthesis or expanders and talk about the patient's own uh, tissue. So, uh, if you talk about their own tissue down here, you're talking about tissue in a flap. And a flap is one of, say, from a plastics point of view, is one of our favorite things. It's about taking tissue, either skin and fat, attached with a blood supply, and bring it to the breast area and reattaching it, or moving it in without disattaching as a pedicle. So it's either a prosthesis reconstruction, prosthetic reconstruction, or it's free tissue, or it's a combination of both. And that's this one here. So whether there, all the types of reconstruction are available in the immediate setting or in the delayed setting. But we might favour one over the other depending on what we're trying to do. And that comes back to the skin again. So just going to more trying to explain the terms we're going along. So if we talk about the prosthetics, we're basically talking about implants. And implant technology has come on a long way from where it was in the 1960s when it was first described. 
We're now in the fifth generation of implants. And these are silicone-based implants in general, and they're textured, and they're often shaped. And they're usually placed in the front of your chest. When someone has a mastectomy, they're placed underneath the muscle in the chest, your pec, pec muscles. And that gives it that shape there of your thing, and that's, that's your implant lying under it. And it gives a, a good reconstruction, especially in the immediate phase when you have your skin. However, sometimes, say in the delays, we may not be able to put that implant in a satisfactory position, and we might need some help. And in that situation, we put these expanders in. And an expander is basically a prosthesis like the implant, but it's just silicone on the outside, and it's filled of saline in the middle. And we put it in the same place, just underneath that pec muscle. And we expand, we close up the, the lady and we bring her back once everything is nice and healed, and about six weeks later, and we ex fill it, keep filling it up with saline, making it bigger and bigger. And that way we get to stretch the skin. And then when we leave, everything settles down approximately six months later, we can go back in and change it to a permanent implant. And for a lot of people, particularly in North America, where 75% of all reconstructions are implant-based, it is very good. However, as you can see, when we place the implant here, you, you often get a weakness down here at the bottom of the breast. And that can cause effacement or loss of that bottom of the breast. And it can cause movement of the implant. One of the really exciting things over the last few years, probably the last 10 years, is the development of acellular dermal matrices. And they're basically matrices, the inner part of skin from various sources, your bovine, fetal bovine, porcine, where, which have been radiated. And the beauty of them is that they can be placed in a hammock shape underneath to give the support to the um, implant. implant. And that gives you a better form of reconstruction. And that even makes things more, even better for us. And we can, there's, there's plenty of evidence throughout the literature showing that it does better, particularly in the radiation cases, where you can get really good aesthetic results. So this, this is really good from, from a prosthetic point of view when we want to go down this route. This is an example of someone who had a mastectomy. So this is at the initial, and this is what we're trying to match. And this is someone at three and a half weeks, and then at four and a half months. So you can get some really good results. Remember when we're trying to reconstruct one, someone, we're trying to get a near normal breast, with regard to size or shape. We're not trying to give someone back their breast. That's, that's beyond us. So that's our target. So, they're quite good. As I said, putting in these prostheses is quite easy. It allows for revision surgery after, specifically if you use expanders. But they do have drawbacks. They're not like breast augmentation, where you have a good coverage over the breast of the normal breast and the implant is gone underneath. They're more superficial. So then the drawbacks are infection rates. Your body mounts a reaction to the implant and that can cause this capsule of scar tissue around the implant. That itself can, might be a problem. But unfortunately, that, caps, that capsule can contract on the implant and cause pain. And that can cause scarring and it can rupture the implant and break or burst the implant. It also can cause pain and it can dis dis distort the implant, the breast looking, and that can be very unsatisfactory. Also, in, when you use implants, they can have a higher complication rate if, they're, if the patient needs radiotherapy later on. And these patients often have to come back again for more and more <coughs> procedures. They have, may have to have the implants replaced or revised overall. So they do have certain drawbacks, but they, they have a very good role. So then that brings us back to, well, if you don't want implants, what are your options? So your options, options again, are come back to the, these flaps, which is tissue with the blood supply. So really, the workhorse was this one up here, which was the, the latissimus dorsi, or the back flap. And that can be used on its own, or with an implant. Or these newer flaps, which we'll go into, which are all from various parts of the body, and that's where we're transferring the tissue in. Now this is the, the back flap, 
which basically, this is the work cost for us in plastic surgery. It's a muscle that lies around just underneath your backbone, that li li lies underneath here, and it's based on a blood supply. Its main blood supply comes from up underneath the armpit. And that means we can cut along here and move that muscle around the front. And if, depending on the lady's size on the opposite side, we can take all a lot, a lot of tissue around the back and close this up and then move it around and use that muscle as a reconstruction on its own. That's called an extended lat dorsi, which is very useful. But more often than not, we need some form of reconstruction underneath it because it's not got enough volume. So we have to go back to the prosthesis that we used, and that will be either an expander or, or um, an implant. So here you see someone who's had a delayed reconstruction. You can see that's part of her skin from her back moved around, and that's the implant. This is a really good reconstruction, and it has been the workhorse for breast reconstruction, especially in the delayed setting. And it, you can get really good results with it. But it still has the drawback of using the prosthetic material or the foreign material. And it does have the infective risk. And when it works, it's fan fantastic. But when it doesn't work, there's problems. And they're the same problems with the, as with the prosthesis. And if you do the flap and then you have to have radiotherapy, it can cause problems with it. So it would be great if we had a, we had a reconstruction that didn't involve the prosthesis. And that's where this Dieppe flap comes in. The Dieppe flap is also called the, the tummy or the abdominal flap. Now, as Prof Hill was talking about the gym that we're all going to go to, <laughs> we're all working on our six packs. All right, so basically the Dieppe what, is a reconstruction of the six pack. So a very smart guy from the States called Bob Allen in 1993 basically followed on research from Australia, showed that vessels that come through the muscle, your six pack, supply the skin at the front of your abdomen. And if we follow that, those vessels through the muscle and back down to where they come from in the groin, and that vessel is called the deep inferior epigastric perforator flap, big fancy name, everyone calls it a Dieppe. If we follow that, but leave the muscle and just take the skin, like so, that allows us to have a really good piece of tissue of reasonable, si of reasonable size. It depends on the body habitus of the patient. But we can take that off and bring it up to the chest and plug it into somewhere on the chest. Now, it's really a matter of choice where you find the vessel in the chest. It can be under a rib here, where you often go into the internal mammary artery, or you can go into the, back into the armpit again. As a standard in Bowman, we generally go into, we take out the rib and we go into the chest, because we find that gives us the better results. But it does involve that reattachment. And that's done at a magnification of 25 times. You're talking about vessels of one millimeter, one and a half millimeters and you have to attach an artery and a vein. So the blood has to go in and come out. And this is the big drawback with this because we can block up surgery. This can take four or five hours to perform. But it gives us a very good result. So this is what we'd be expecting in the immediate setting. The patient has kept her skin envelope and we have supplied the volume in the middle. Or in the delayed setting where we have to use the skin from the bottom down here to reconstruct that breast. So it is very useful. And this is a lady who's had um, an immediate reconstruction, and you can see the Dieppe there, and you see the good shape that she can, you can achieve with this. Now, this sounds like the panacea of everything, but not everyone is suitable for these reconstructions. There's lots of reasons why. It, may, it goes back to that decision-making process I talked about earlier of between the patient, the breast surgeon, and the reconstructive surgeon. You may, not, you may have had abdominal surgery and therefore had an incision in your six pack and therefore the blood vessels may not be there. You may not have enough weight to have this reconstruction. So there is other options. And these options come from inside the thigh, called the tug flap. Or it can come from the back, which can be either, it comes from the gluteal reason, so we call it so S gap or I gap, superior gluteal artery perforator, inferior gluteal artery perforator. 
So the, these, and there's, there's loads of other flaps that we can use when we can't do a DEP. But the great thing about the DEP flaps is there's, there's a standardised technique. These other flaps are not done as often and they're more challenging. Therefore, the anaesthetic time, the theatre time goes up. So they are for a more sub-select group of patients. But it is exciting times then we are to see the, how the changes that have happened. So really, Dieppe's developed in 94, came into Irish practice in the early 21st century, and now it's becoming more and more common. And we're doing these all the time in Beaumont now. So it's a great reconstruction. It's the patient's own tissue. So it, fee it gives you soft, there's no implant involved. So there's a very low revision rate. It does have a flat failure, so that microanastomosis doesn't always work. It can clot up a block. And when it doesn't work, it's gone. We've lost the flap. It's rare, it's probably in the order of about 2 or 3%, but it's really upsetting to everyone when it doesn't work. And the main issue is the drill anaesthetic time. If we could shorten our anaesthetic time, and there are things that are happening that are beyond the scope of this talk, which are, we are trying to make the anaesthetic time talk, and that's the excitement of the future. There's devices that are helping us with this anastomosis, etc. It would be a great hurdle, but we're not quite there yet. It still takes an it's still a really extensive surgery. So overall, there's a wide variety of options. There's no perfect solution. But all patients should be considered for breast reconstruction. They may opt not to, that's fine, but they should at least have the conversation, and that's where awareness comes in. The timing of the reconstruction is a giant decision, the type of reconstruction, but it, there is a lot of patient empowerment. There's no technique that's perfect, they all have their drawbacks, but it's, it's like finding the perfect match, the perfect part, or the perfect, perfect breast reconstruction for, for the patient who comes in. Thank you. For me personally, the most inter interesting part was the it was Dr. Barry's lecture because it related directly to my condition and my surgery and my treatment. And I was I came to hear uh, up to date information on the development of treatment of current treatment of cancer, and I did hear some interesting things that that definitely related to me.